found online. But uh, this is a pretty good picture, I thought, that I could use for the teaching, where Jacob is giving each blessing uh, for each son. So then they give each emblem or symbol for each son that Jacob describes the blessing towards. So we covered Reuben, we covered Simeon and Levi, and then we're still onward on Judah. When we're covering Judah, we were covering uh, two things. We're covering uh, the uh, prophecies of the Messiah on Judah, uh, the first coming and second coming of Christ or the Messiah here. So that is evidence that in the Bible, dispensationalism is a must. The reason why is the prophecies of the Messiah are undoubtable proof. When you look at that text, you can tell it has to split into two different comings. Uh, mainline Christianity will even agree and teach that, that there are two different comings for Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's why they talk about a second coming of Christ. Uh, this is not some kind of new teaching or strange stuff. This is accepted by mainline Christianity. Amen. They believe that there is a first coming and a second coming of Christ. So because in Jacob's prophecies for his boys are given as the end times for the Messiah lineage when he was blessing Judah, we can tell that you can't apply it to just one time period. You'll have to split it to two separate time periods, which is the first and second coming of Christ. And the evidence will be when we uh, look at some of the verses together. All right, so uh, let's look at Genesis. <clears throat> We're going to go to the book of Genesis. And then uh, chapter 49 and verse 9, uh, verse 10. We left off at verse 10 in our last Genesis study. Genesis chapter 49, and we are in verse 10. <clears throat> the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, in our last Genesis study, I've explained to you uh, the meaning of verse 10, where basically Judah will maintain the royal lineage. It will not be left. It will not depart from him. The gathering of the people were described in four different areas. The national restoration, uh, the church, and then uh, several other things that I've given to you in our last Genesis study. We are now in verse 11, so I will explain every word in verse 11 now. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. These two verses are evidence that they have to be split to the first and second coming of Christ, or the Messiah. There is no doubt this is referring to the Messianic prophecy. Mainline Christians will agree with that. But what they don't really get into or what they don't really tell you is this is evidence that you have to practice dispensationalism or rightly dividing. They will tell you this is the prophecy of the Messiah, but they don't tell you here about one of the key biblical hermeneutics tool on rightly dividing. Now, notice right here, so I'll explain every word first and then I'll explain the dispensationalism method. So the Messiah, we know that's a prophecy. Uh, from the context of verse 10. So verse 11, what will the Messiah do? He will bind, so he will make sure that he ties his foal unto the vine. So whatever this foal is, is going to be tied to the vine. And his ass is colt unto the choice vine. So whatever this ass is colt that the Messiah will use, it will tie to the best or the choice, uh, the best of the choice vine. What, uh, what do they all have to do with that? So, uh, let's go one by one right here. So, the colt right here, it is referring to a young ass. It is in reference to a young ass. Hopefully, the camera zoomed in right here where people can really see the definition. So, binding, uh, what it's talking about right here is binding, notice, the foal first and then the ass's colt. Colt is young donkey, but it says ass's colt. So, ass, we know, in the... Uh, old English is referring to donkey. 
So this is a donkey's child. That's the idea, see, when it's saying ass is colt, because colt is a young ass here. And then foal right here is pretty much the same thing. Notice right here, foal, colt. So this is referring to basically uh, a baby horse or baby donkey. That's the idea. So th that's what we received from this verse. So the Messiah, when we go back uh, to the whiteboard here, the Messiah, he's going to make sure that he's going to tie that uh, baby donkey to the vine. Okay, so we can guess right here about the Messiah. Uh, he rode uh, on a donkey, and we do know that in his first coming, when he did the Lord's Supper, he did the vine, right? And the vine is a picture of his blood. So it's tying basically a suffering Messiah. That's the whole bottom line of his first coming, is referring to a suffering Messiah. So that's the part that the Jews overlooked, see? You can prove Jesus is the Messiah by Genesis chapter 49, verse 11. Genesis, I've given, demonstrated some things already in Genesis we see proof of Jesus being God, Jesus being the Messiah, just in the book of Genesis alone. We've seen that place with the angel of the Lord. We see the place with the Trinity. And then we see that uh, with Genesis chapter 49 and verse 11. So Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, uh, already showed Christian doctrines. That's amazing. So you can use that for the Jew if they have a hard time believing in it. Now, we're going to look at several passages, and I'm going to use uh, Dr. Upman's commentary, as always, because he has some several good things here. We're going to look at Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. So we're first going to look at Zechariah chapter 9, and then we'll look at verse 9, and then I want you to go to Matthew 21. I want you to go to Zechariah 9, and then I want you to go to Matthew chapter 21. We'll notice from these two passages that Jesus Christ, he fulfilled the scripture, he fulfilled Jacob's prophecy in being the suffering Messiah, in riding on a donkey. All right, we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 21, and then we're also going to look at Zechariah chapter 9. All right, verse 9 says, in verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass. Notice the wordings here, how it matched with Jacob's prophecy. Upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. See that? There's no doubt that Zechariah is following along with Jacob's prophecy. Now look at this being fulfilled at Matthew 21, verse 5. Matthew chapter 21, verse 5. Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek. See, not, not triumphant, meek, yeah, yeah. humble. So that's a lowly, suffering Messiah. That's not a triumphant, uh, victorious king. Triumphant, victorious king is the second coming. Tell ye, uh, the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. See these words, how they match with Zechariah and Jacob's prophecy again. Then when you go to uh, Matthew chapter, uh, you don't really have to turn there, but if people want to see how it's tied to the vine, is pretty obvious. In Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, verse 27 through 29, Chapter 26, verse 27 through 29, you can see right there that Jesus Christ is tying himself to the vine, which is his suffering, his crucifixion. All right, so in the first coming, we see several things here. We see in Zechariah 9, as well as Matthew chapter 21 and 26. that this is all referring to the suffering Messiah, the suffering Messiah riding upon uh, a foal or a colt, an ass's colt, and then we see also the vine, which is his blood. 
Obviously, I'm not saying that the vine, it, the grape juice that Jesus was drinking is his literal blood, but it picture. It's all figurative. You can tell from the language right here when Jacob is giving the prophecy, he mingles it up with figurative language. Okay, so this is the first coming, but the second coming, notice it's blank. See that? It's blank. So then this is where you force in. You have to put in dispensationalism, no doubt, when you keep reading. All right, returning to our text at Genesis 49. <clears throat> Notice that we didn't finish verse 11. So the middle of a verse, you split it. Verse 11. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So this Messiah, he washes his garments in that blood, all right? So remember, the vine, the wine, the grapes is all figurative for blood. So he washes his garments in blood and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So his clothes get dipped in grape juice, all right, which is representing blood. His eyes shall be red with wine. So then when he, uh, when he washes his garments in the, in the, excuse me, in blood, his eyes are also going to be red like wine. It's going to be like a drunken man almost. His teeth white with milk, so his teeth is going to be glistening white. So you can tell from the language right here, this is not a meek, uh, meek uh, sort of communication or speech or language. This is something where it seems like vengeance. It seems like something terrible. It seems something powerful, weighty. Whereas verse 11... We saw at the beginning, it sounded very meek. It matched well with the suffering Messiah. Now, some commentators, they amateurish. I don't know how they make this mistake, but th there's no doubt this is referring to the second coming when you look at Isaiah 61. Go to Isaiah 61. They tie that to his first coming. So I guess that's because they're ignorant of dispensationalism or they're really ignorant of the Bible. But there is no doubt that this is referring to second coming. You cannot tie that to the first coming. Go to Isaiah 61, <clears throat> and then I want you to go to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Now, Revelation, remember, is a book about end times. It's the future. So look at this right here, okay? There's no doubt that this is referring to his second coming. We're going to look at the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. Isaiah 61. Notice right here that at verse uh, 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. So notice right here we see the language a bit about his second advent where there's vengeance and where he's going to make sure that justice is properly served. And then we're also going to look at... Uh, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 19. I want you to go and jump to Revelation chapter 19. Okay. Notice right here that the word of God reads, look at the language. This is him at verse 11, right? Jesus Christ coming down at Armageddon. Notice verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire. See that? His eyes are having vengeance, kind of matching with Genesis 49. Notice verse 13. He was clothed with the vesture, what? Dipped in blood. That matched with Genesis 49, where his garment is dipped in blood. So we see right here the passages that no doubt prove uh, the second advent, or which is referring to the future coming of the Messiah where he conquers the world. Also Isaiah 63 Go to Isaiah 63. This is very plain right here. I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 63. <clears throat> the second coming, his garments are dipped in blood. So his garments in blood is not referring to his suffering, to his first coming. This is referring to him coming down in vengeance. Garments in blood, also uh, eyes. that are red, right? So we've seen that in Genesis 49, red like wine, and then we've seen Revelation 19, eyes red like a flame of fire. So this is all referring to the same thing. Isaiah 63, and then uh, verse 1. 
Who is this that cometh from Edom with what? Dyed garments from Basra. So his garments are dipped in red. Verse 2, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that what? Treadeth in the wine fat grapes. I have trodden in the wine press alone. Oh, now we see why his garments are dipped in blood. He's treading, he's stepping on his enemies, the people at Armageddon. So that's why that blood uh, soaks his garments at the bottom. So this is referring to his second coming. So notice right here, when you look at these two, this proves dispensationalism at the very first book in your Bible. Very first book in your Bible demands dispensationalism. There's no doubt about that. That is a must uh, biblical tool and method. To deny dispensationalism, you will deny 90%, 90% nearly of right doctrine. All right, go to Genesis 49. Genesis 49. Maybe even more, you're right. Maybe even much more. It's crucial that you rightly divide. All right, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 49, and then now we're at verse 13 covering Zebulun. All right, so let's go back to our nice little picture over here. All right. And then we'll cover uh, Zebulun. So Zebulun, he has to do with the ships here. Okay. When we go to... Yeah, you getting a blessing? Yeah, right. <laughs> Genesis, I'm trying to look professional, not smiling too much. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a lot of fun, yeah. All right. Yeah, we're, we're going to get the kids leaving Sunday school class now. They're, they're going to go, I want to attend this class. How much fun, you know. All right, Genesis 49, 13, excuse me. <clears throat> Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea, <clears throat> and he shall be for an haven of ships, and his uh, border shall be unto Zidon. Uh, what's important to understand, I'll explain every word again. So Zebulun, Zebulun, his living, his habitation, is going to be toward the sea. So wherever he's going to be, li be living, it's going to be close to the sea. That's his haven. That's going to be his resting place. It's going to be basically a haven of ships. So he is going, his dwelling place is going to be a haven for all the ships, as verse 13 reads there. Now remember, I'm going to be explaining every word in the verse, so make sure you're looking at your Bible and making sure every word matches with my explanation, okay? So that's the reason why it's going to be a haven. It's going to be for the ships. His border is going to be up to Zidon, all right? It's going to be up to Zidon. Now, this is something important that you need to hear, that... I was very shocked on how many commentators and even maps made the mistake here. Uh, Dr. Ruckman pointed this out very well. He mentions here that the border, uh, on his Genesis commentary, the border of Zebulun is said to be Zidon. Thus, Frank uh, Delich is greatly in error when he sticks Zebulun down between Chinnereth and the Mediterranean, with no seaport open to the tribe. Other members of the Scholars' Union, following in the least steps, adopt the same location for Zebulun. So the problem is this, which I don't understand. So we can only go by Dr. Uckman's maps here, all right? So here's uh, Dr. Uckman's map. So Dr. Ruckman's map, you'll notice, uh, if you have a Ruckman Reference Bible, you can conveniently, conveniently see it at the map section. He put Zebulun properly right here. Now, that's our understanding, too, when you read the text, right? It's pretty obvious. But the majority of the maps that I see put Zebulun in the middle. So he has no access uh, to that sea. So what they claim, the scholars, what they try to do is that Zebulun has access to the sea through like channels or through some kind of open trade route. So even though Zebulun is somewhere here in the middle that the major majority of maps put, they'll somehow have some kind of trade route or open route where Zebulun can be able to trade with the ships in the sea. But that's not what the text said. The text said it will be a haven for ships. Yeah. So I don't know how you're going to put ships over here in the middle, okay? I think some other maps, they will try to connect that to here. All right, oh, good. So there's a little target thing right here that I can move, but I don't know if you all can see that, all right? But anyway, 
Oh, let's move out there. That's annoying now. But then, <laughs> but I think some maps, they'll try to put it over here, all right? So they'll try to, oh my goodness, now what am I doing? Okay, so they try to target uh, this area here. Oh, okay, that's better, all right. So they try to target to the Sea of Galilee area, but Dr. Uckman, uh, he puts it right over here. He tries to aim it toward the Mediterranean Sea region, which is uh, far more accurate how I see. So his border is going to be all the way up to Zidon, and then he's also going to have a haven for ships. Uh, some texts that we can look at concerning Zebulun. Dr. Upman gives some of the following right here. He gives, uh, let's see, uh, he points out Deuteronomy chapter 33. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 33. Zebulun's portion ran from Galilee to the seaports of Phoenicia. So that's why we can see right here from uh, Galilee, because that's uh, where the Sea of Galilee is located, okay? So from Galilee and then up to Phoenicia. Now, if you don't know about your history, Phoenicia was one of those uh, most powerful kingdoms uh, next to Egypt that time, because Phoenicia's empire followed along the sea route, so it reached up to Africa, actually because it was following along the Mediterranean Sea. So it was a very powerful kingdom. So Zebulun would go up to that point. All right, uh, we're going to Deuteronomy. I said 33, Deuteronomy chapter 33, and then we'll read verse 18, chapter 33 and verse 18. We can see that his borderline is given uh, by, Josh, uh, by Moses as follows. Verse 18, and Zebulun, he said, rejoice Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents, they shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. So notice right here, he has to be connected to the sea. Now we're going to go back to Genesis 49. And then now we're going to cover Issachar. All right, so let's get out of here. So Issachar is as follows. We can see that he's matching up with the donkey here. In Genesis chapter 49 and verse 14, Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. So Issachar is represented as a strong donkey. He's, uh, he's couching down. That's the same thing as um, verse 9. I've explained that before. The couching down, kind of like the lion, where he's going down like this, right? He's stooping down, uh, ready to take action. Judah's case, he's stooping down to attack. Issachar's case, he's stooping down where he can carry the burdens. So the reason why he's couching down between two burdens, you can guess, is because there are two baggages, and then uh, you put that on the donkey's back, and then I guess there's some kind of strap or some kind of holding thing that will hold the two burdens. And then you'll notice that the donkeys will have the burdens on each side right here. And then on the back is some kind of strap or some kind of holding, uh, holding thing for the two burdens. So you can picture that with the, with the donkey. So he has, he's got a strong back. He can uh, bear his load really good. So in verse 15, he sees that the relaxation, the resting, is very good. Okay, so even though he carries his load very good, uh, he, he likes the rest. You can see that. Now, this can be quite a good sermon right here for a Christian. Notice when you keep reading in verse 15, he sees that the land is very pleasant. So he, can he likes to settle down. He doesn't like to carry. So what happens here, which is very strange, he bowed his shoulder to bear. So then because of the land being pleasant, he can see that he can relax himself. He bows his shoulder down to bear the load. He became a servant unto tribute. So he becomes a slave. He becomes a servant uh, to taxation to serve different nations or different people. Now, notice right here, the idea is 
He is compromising. He is willing to enslave himself so that he can relax. Now, that's, a, that's an eye-opening sermon you can do right over there. That's an eye-opening sermon right there. So Issachar, he's willing to make compromises. He's willing to enslave himself just so that he can enjoy uh, the pleasantries of life, so that he can get his rest. Now, we see right here that tribute is, uh, Issachar indeed pays tribute to his other brethren and foreign invaders as follows. We're going to look at Joshua 16. Joshua chapter 16. There are several passages. We're going to look at Joshua 16, as well as Numbers, uh, Deuteronomy 20, <clears throat> Joshua 16. And then we're going to look at Deuteronomy 20. And then the last one is 1 Kings chapter 9. 1 Kings chapter 9. So Deuteronomy 20, Joshua 16, and 1 Kings chapter 9. Chapter 9. In these three passages, Issachar, he indeed pays tribute to foreign invaders, including his brethren. Including his brethren. All right, we're going to first look at Joshua chapter 16 and verse 10. The Bible says here in verse 10, And they drave, uh, they drave not out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwell among the Ephraimites unto this day, and serve under tribute. So you'll notice right here uh, that this portion from the children of Israel, and then Issachar has connections to that, that they were serving tribute to the Canaanites. Also look at De uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 11 reads, And it shall be, if it, uh, if it make the answer of peace, and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. So God, he makes mentions about uh, people becoming tribute, and he can even mention about certain brethren where they end up in tribute. First Kings chapter 9, verse 21. First Kings chapter 9, and then verse 21. The Bible points out here that... Uh, these Jews, that they're, uh, tri they are serving tribute. Their children that were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel also were not able to utterly destroy. Upon those did Solomon levy a tribute, a bond service unto this day. So notice that there are Jews who uh, served under taxation. Foreign invaders who ended up, uh, who had the Jews serving taxation. You can bet that Issachar follow along, uh, follows along with them, as prophesied by the Bible that Issachar would do so. So saved Christians have no business, have no business ending up their lives that way. Amen? Uh, look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Famous passage. Famous passage. A lot of people, for the pleasure of sin, they're willing to compromise and become its slave. So Issachar definitely uh, pictures that well. Now, the Christian life, we might think that the burden is pretty heavy uh, to bear, but you can carry your load well, you have to realize. You can carry your load very well. Uh, we'll put Issachar right here. So Issachar, he definitely pictures that saved Christian where he can carry the load very well, uh, you can compare that with Matthew 11. You don't have to turn there, but the last verses in Matthew chapter 11 points out that the saved uh, believer, he is able to carry uh, the burdens because it is light. He can carry it well because of Jesus Christ. But then, what does the saved believer always get deceived by? This burden is too heavy to carry. So then, they're willing to become slaves for sin, thinking that the rest is good, that the land is good, uh, just like the Bible mentioned about Issachar, Issachar. So even though he carries his burden well, he says, no, uh, I want to rest. I want to settle down. So he makes compromises and, will, and is willing to carry the burden and the taxation of sin instead. So it's very strange about, say, believers is that we want to get rid of our burden just to carry another burden. Yeah. That's the idea. So you have to keep that in mind. He 
So isn't it strange that you carry your burden well, but you're willing to uh, compromise so that you can rest, but the rest is actually another burden in return. All right, we're going to look at Romans uh, chapter 6, and then notice right here that uh, points out that it's not really rest, but it's actually slavery to sin. R Romans chapter 6, uh, notice right here that the Bible points out at verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Verse 13, uh, verse 12, that's a better verse. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. All right, so don't let them rule over your life, reign over you. Don't be under its taxation. That ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. All right, we'll go back to Genesis 49. Genesis 49. So, say, believer, that's something to think about, is when you feel like that you want to settle down, and because your burden's too heavy that the Lord has given to you, when the Lord already told you that it is light, it's not heavy, don't be deceived into thinking that I can finally rest when I let this burden go. No, you're just uh, falling into another burden. You're willing to enslave yourself, carry the burden of sin rather than the burden that Jesus Christ gives to you. And that is a very risky, dangerous game that you're playing. You don't want to end up like that. All right, then the very next verse at Genesis chapter uh, 49. And then we come to Dan. Very interesting stuff. Verse 16. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. All right. Let me explain every word in the verse first. All right. Pay attention to your Bibles. So Dan is going to uh, judge. He's going to join as one of the judges for the people. All right, so he's going to come out as one of the conquerors as well on top. As one of the tribes of Israel, he'll be able to judge his people. Verse 17, he's going to be, he's likened to a snake, a serpent. That's by the wayside. An adder in the path, so that's a poisonous snake. In the pathway, he's going to be that poisonous snake that bites the, the heels of the horse so that his rider shall fall backward. So the person who's riding on that horse, you can see that this is referring to a soldier or a conqueror. But uh, the serpent is going to conquer that soldier by biting the heels of the horse. And then the rider is going to fall backward consequently. Verse 18 is very strange right here. Jacob talks about uh, referring to himself, I'm waiting for your salvation, God. Now, when you look up that word salvation throughout uh, the Old Testament, this is referring to Second Advent. It is referring to Jesus Christ, where he delivers his people, the Jews, and when he delivers his people, the Jews, who are waiting for their conquering king and Messiah. So it is strange that uh, Dan is following within the line here of tribulation. That's important to keep in mind. He is following within the line here of tribulation context. Uh, we're going to look at uh, several interesting passages concerning the Danites. Uh, first of all, I want you to go to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 and Genesis 3. Revelation chapter 7. And then I want you to go to Genesis chapter 3. A couple things to note about Dan here. Okay, we covered Issachar, we covered Judah. Uh, let's cover some interesting things on Dan. Dan, we see the first key that uh, the context, the timeline is tribulation, okay? We saw that so far. So then why is 
than important for the tribulation. What you're going to find out is Dan is likened to a serpent, right? Is a serpent mentioned in the tribulation? Yes. You don't have to turn there because we're going to compare it with Genesis 3, but you can turn there if you want. But Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, we see Satan, that old serpent, is present during the tribulation. So Dan, he's tied to that serpent in the tribulation. Something strange there. And I've explained to you uh, before about this, but it bears repeating because some people might have forgotten or don't know it. This is their first time for some of them. It's not mentioned in Revelation 7. Other tribes are mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. So I'm not going to read it because I've done it before, but you can look at it yourself. You can glance through it. But Dan is not mentioned at Revelation chapter 7. But any mention of it is serpent, and the serpent is present at the tribulation. So it shows right here more and more how Dan is connected to a bad guy then, not the good guys. Good guys from the Jews are mentioned in Revelation 7. Dan's not mentioned as one of the good guys. So for some strange reason, he's tied to the bad guys. Now, given its history, we already know, all right? given Dan's biblical history. And I've explained that in some other uh, passages before. In his history, Dan is connected uh, to Baal worship. He is connected uh, to Baal worship. We see that with uh, Jezebel's case, and we see that with uh, the book of Judges, those Danites. They take those images. Now, Dan, he's located, interestingly... Uh, where those Phoenicians are located. The Phoenicians, for some of you uh, who don't know, they carried on Semiramis, Nimrod's religion. So Phoenicia had access worldwide due to his sea trading route. That's how that Babylonian worship religion spread about. And Dan had a part in that. So notice that Dan is connected to Sem Semiramis, Nimrod, Baal worship. That religion is continued today through the Roman Catholic Church, and the Bible says that Roman Catholic Church will be present and is mentioned at Revelation chapter 17. And the Antichrist is tied to that Roman Catholic Church when you read Revelation 17, because he's connected to that dragon. And the woman, the Roman Catholic Church, is connected to the dragon. Okay, so... Uh, he has a history of Baal worship, so it has to do with Antichrist. Genesis 3 is the closest that we can see, is the closest in matching with uh, Jacob's prophecy. So don't forget that promise that God gave to Eve about her seed. That's versing against the serpent's seed, serpent's lineage. Why will his lineage be tied to Dan then? It's very strong. It's very strong. Genesis chapter 3, notice at verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, okay, the serpent seed, and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. So uh, the Messiah's lineage from Eve's seed will bruise the serpent's head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. But the serpent is going to bruise the heel. Okay, now when we go back to Genesis 49... What we could say right here is that it's possible that Jacob, when he was trying to uh, give the blessing to Dan, that Dan would be a conqueror, that soldiers who ride on horses when they try to conquer him, he has a history of biting the heels. So because of that, the rider will fall backward. However, at the same time, like I've taught you so many times in blessings and curses, you can either use them well or, use, or abuse them. So just because you're cursed doesn't mean that it has to end up in a bad way, remember. I've given an example with Ham's lineage, right? You can use a curse well to your advantage for the glory of God. And then I pointed out with the blessing, just because you're blessed by God doesn't mean it can turn out well. You can abuse the blessing. The greatest example are Jews, actually. They've abused the blessing, and that's why you get a lot of Jewish globalists, Jewish elites. Jewish bankers, why? Because God gave them the promise of the physical riches. 
And then they abused it, and some of them sold their souls to the devil. But anyway, uh, besides that kind of, uh, be besides that, getting back to the main point, then he can receive that as a blessing by conquering uh, riders, conquering soldiers. But according to Genesis chapter 3, uh, it's not going to be that case, even though he'll take that as an advantage. So think of it this way, see? He has a history of conquering, winning by biting heels. Okay? So don't you think that the group of people, if they're going to be the bad guys, if they have a history of conquering people by biting the heels, they're going to think when those... When Jesus Christ comes down with his soldiers, I have a history of conquering so many soldiers by biting the heels, I can do it again. The devil is known as a serpent. He has a history of biting heels and seeing so many great conquerors and riders fall. He thinks he can do that with Jesus. See that? So that's something to think about. But Jesus Christ, we do know this, even though the serpent... And Dan has a history of biting heels. Jesus Christ, he's, going to, uh, he's just going to stomp that serpent's head. He's going to stomp the serpent's head. No matter how great mankind thinks they are by biting heels, Jesus Christ, he's just going to stomp their head and return, and they're crushed. So the head gets crushed. All right, um, we're going to uh, go back now. All right, we're going to go back to Genesis 49. All right, I'm still a little slippery here. I'm getting used to this, all right? All right, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 49. Just switching screens it can be a little pain in the neck. <laughs> all right, Genesis chapter 49, and then uh, we'll look at uh, verse... 19 here so verse 19 so we already can guess about waiting for their salvation right so it's that messianic conquer he crushes the serpent's head so it's very strange how that's mingled in uh, with dan's prophecy verse 19 gad a troop shall overcome him but he shall overcome at the last so uh Gad, he is given a very short legacy in Jacob's testament. So a troop is basically going to conquer him, but he's going to conquer them in return. All right, we're going to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 12. 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and 1 Chronicles 5. We're going to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and 1 Chronicles 5. All right, if you look at that picture there, we can see how the... Uh, Gadites are described as. Now we're going to look at the verses, all right? So we're going to look at 1 Chronicles 5 and 1 Chronicles chapter 12. All right, if you're in chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 8. Verse 8, the Bible reads, And of the Gadites, there separated themselves unto David into the hold to the wilderness, men of might and men of war, fit for the battle, that could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions, and were as swift as the rose upon the mountains. So notice right here that uh, they can put to flight anybody that tries to conquer them. When we look at chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 20, chapter 5, verse 20, the Bible reads, And they were helped against them, and the Hagarites were delivered into their hand, and all that were uh, with them. For they cried to God in the battle. So context is inclusive of the Gadites at verse 18, okay? Continuing on, and he was entreated of them because they put their trust in him and they took away their cattle of their camels 50,000 and of sheep 250,000 and of asses 2,000 and of men 100,000. Uh, for there fell down many slain because the war was of God and they dwelt in their steads until the captivity. So notice right here that uh, the Gadites, they were able to conquer their enemies really well were able to conquer their enemies really well. Okay, now uh, we return back to Genesis 49. Let's continue on the blessings. Asher is next, verse 20. Out of Asher his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Okay, so we'll notice right here that in Asher he's given, according to the picture there, if the camera can zoom in over there, as someone very fat, you can say, as someone who just enjoys food. So yeah, anybody would want that blessing, right? In verse 20, so 
uh, Jacob says, out of Asher, his family. So his food, that's what his bread is referring to, is going to be fat. It's going to be big. It's going to be plenteous. He's going to give, he's going to yield. He's going to give out royal dainties. All right, that's self-explanatory. All right, anybody would want that. Anybody would want that kind of a blessing in their lives. We're going to look at Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy chapter 33. And then we'll look at verse 24. Deuteronomy chapter 33. And then we'll look at verse 24. Now notice that the blessings are given to Asher as follows. Deuteronomy chapter 33. And then uh, we'll look at verse 24. The Bible points out, and of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children, let him be acceptable to his brethren, and let him, notice right here, dip his foot in oil. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. What we see uh, from uh, several portions of this text, that Asher, he dips his foot in oil, so he's going to be rich like that, and he's going to be a conqueror at verse 25. But there are some issues here, some issues concerning Asher. That's why you have to be dispensational. There's no doubt about that. In Asher's line, we don't see mention of that. The only mention you'll see is Deuteronomy. But Deuteronomy, they didn't conquer the promised land yet. So this is all a future reference. Now, already the context, I think, of verse 1 of Genesis 49 already gave you the hint. This is last days, see? So majority, you have, there's no doubt, you have to, uh, you can't be preterist, all right, in your theology. That's, uh, that does not work in scripture. You really have to twist words. You really have to make it so figurative that it's outlandish. And then you'll have to agree with the liberals. You can interpret the Bible however way you want to. See, so that's very dishonest. Uh, you have to be dispensational, no doubt. A lot of it is jumped to future timeline. So Asher's prophecy about uh, his food being plenteous, there's no mention of that in Scripture. And then also uh, his conquest, like iron and brass. So... We don't see much of that mention concerning about Asher. So this is a future timeline. So we see his access to oil. And then also the, the conquest or his victories is going to be iron and brass. And then in the Bible, that kind of language, we know it to be like a strong conqueror, like a strong conqueror if it is described to you as follows. All right, now, if these are the hints that we get from Asher, Dr. Upman sums it up well in his Genesis commentary. He says, one, Asher must be wealthy and prosperous. Two, he must bring forth baked meats, pastries, and expensive foods for a king. Three, he must be accepted among the 12 tribes, in spite of the fact that there would be good reasons for the other ones to be jealous of him. Four, he must have access to oil deposits. Five, he must be able to conquer his enemies and step on them. Six, he must be in good health till he dies. And his tribe must prosper as long as time runs. The only passage that you can, uh, the only timeline, and you can guess, the only timeline you can think that would match it very well will have to be millennium then. So, which will be Revelation chapter 20, right? But I want to point out something else interesting, all right? Let's go to Revelation 6. So this is my theory, all right? So if it's future, then this is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, all right? So the future timeline is millennium, but I also want to add this. It's very possible that also the future timeline will be tribulation, okay? Okay? Tribulation. Now, uh, there's no mention about this in Scripture except one word. Except one word. That can match up with this one. Now, remember, those Jews, they have to be strong in their conquest, right? To defeat the Antichrist. 
uh, in the Bible, uh, we'll, we'll look at that one too, okay? So I'm not just going to uh, just say it nonchalantly and assume you all agree with me. All right, go to Zechariah 12 and keep your hand at Revelation 6, okay? Go to Zechariah chapter 12. And then uh, I want you also turn to Revelation chapter 6. All right, now when we look at uh, Zechariah 12 and Revelation chapter 6, there are some interesting mentions here. Now here's the theory that uh, y'all been waiting for. So I think this, it's possible because the Jews have to prepare for the millennial kingdom anyway, and a great example is Matthew 5 through 7. So tribulation saints, they follow the kingdom gospel or elements or some parts of the kingdom gospel to prepare for their millennial kingdom ahead. Uh, I'm not going to go deep. Okay, forget it. All right, so. All right, uh, point is, is that if those Jews are preparing for their millennial kingdom during the tribulation, then this should be uh, able to occur during the tribulation timeline then. Those Jews are preparing. Okay, what are they preparing here? They're preparing oil, richness, as well as conquest and victory. Now, uh, when you look at Zechariah 12 right here, those Jews are preparing for war against the Antichrist. They have to do self-defense, all right, national security. Look at Zechariah chapter 12. Uh, notice right here, that he says, verse 3, and in that day, so that's a future day, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So they're going up against the Jews. And then notice right here that the Jews, that they're rallying themselves up. The Bible says in verse 5, And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. So they're relying on their military power right here. And notice right here that at verse uh, 8, In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord uh, before them, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Notice right here that those Jews, that they're rallying themselves up for battle. So uh, we can see right here the victory or the conquest that's like iron and brass. But then the oil here at Revelation 6, only, this is the only closest mention, is that third horseman that comes out. The third seal of Revelation. Revelation 6.6. 6. Uh, the Bible says, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the what? Oil and the wine. So the oil access is important. But the second thing is food is mentioned at verse 6. Asher is connected to what? Food. Okay, I'm wondering this. The Antichrist always has it. Uh, the Antichrist, we know, he wants the nation of Israel. He wants to conquer it. Ash, I'm wondering if Asher is that particular tribe where the Antichrist can conquer and want some of the riches for himself. So then uh, we, we hear so much about oil going on, right, in the Middle East. So I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if Israel will have access, a richness to that. Second thing is their food supply. I wonder if the Antichrist would want access to that. But it would make a lot of sense. So what I'm giving to you is just guesswork, but if you look at current events going on right now, uh, keep your eyes on Israel, and if there is a tribe called Asher that can be traced, you wander around that terrain, that area. If you look at uh, Dr. Uckman's map, uh, if we were to go back over there again, okay, uh, I'm wondering if, you're, if something's going on in your current events right here, okay? So it's just guesswork. But maybe the riches, the oil deposit, the food supplies might be in that particular section in Israel. 
And then Asher will build himself up in that. And then the Antichrist would want that for himself. As famine increases, food supply gets lower, a lot of people are getting worried about that. I mean, two years ago, people were so worried about that, that they were overstocking, right? But keep your eyes peeled as that when America and uh, the United Nations, the world falls apart, they might just want that piece of land for themselves for something. Okay, but keep your eyes peeled on that. Anyway, let's go to Genesis 49. This is all just guesswork, obviously. Genesis 49, verse 21. All right, Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. Uh, so Naphtali, uh, the Bible points out that he is uh, said to possess the west and the south, and that can be found at Deuteronomy 33, 23. If you look at your map, you can see right here, he, Naphtali possesses uh, the western uh, part over there. But he gets some portion in the south as well, which is described at Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 23. Uh, you don't really have to turn there. But anyways, Dr. Uckman argues here that the southwest of Deuteronomy 33, 23 must therefore, uh, must therefore refer to the southwest section of Galilee or the southwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. It cannot refer to southwest Palestine. His reasoning is as follows. He says nearly all maps have Nap. Naphtali possessing the extreme middle north. Even in the millennium, Naphtali's portion of land runs across the north end of Palestine, a good 50 miles north of Galilee. So that's his reasoning why. So that's the reason why that map, it doesn't really show where he's like really at the south there. It's more so at the, the southwest uh, section of Galilee, Dr. Upman reasons. All right, so um, Naphtali, how does he fulfill the scripture here with goodly words? Is some interesting stuff here. There are some interesting stuff. We look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 13, all right? Naphtali is mentioned here at Matthew chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. All right, go to Matthew chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. All right, closing it off here. When did Naphtali ever give goodly words, right? Like, you're trying to search that all over your Bible. But the clue is in Matthew 4. And Jesus was preaching here. And Naphtali is mentioned, or one of his locations is mentioned. Okay. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 4, and then uh, we'll look at verse 13, okay? The Bible points out, In leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zabulon. All right, that's the sea coast of Galilee, right? Dr. Upman reasons that uh, Naphtali is going to be close by, correct? Let's guess if that's true. Verse 13, borders of Zabulon and what? Naphthalim. Okay, so that's Naphtali right there. Verse 14, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, okay, so Jesus is going there to fulfill a prophecy. Verse 15, the land of Zabulon and the land of Naphtalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Why? We know what that is. That's Jesus bringing light to them. How does he bring light to them? It's through his preaching, obviously, his ministry. And notice verse 17, the first words Jesus ever preached to the populace. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, Jesus is preaching for Naphtali is actually him doing those goodly words. Now remember, Jesus Christ, the Bible says he was preaching the what? Gospel, all right? Now remember, it's not referring to our Christian gospel. Uh, gospel simply means good news, but I already gave you the answer. Gospel means what? Good news, so goodly words. Notice right here that the Bible says, 
at Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, 23, and Jesus went about all Galilee, right? So Naphtali would be connected to that, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the what? Gospel. See, that goodly words are spoken. That's how Naphtali's prophecy was fulfilled, where goodly words are spoken, all right? So Naphtali, let me explain every word. He is like a deer that's uh, free, all right? That's not bound and gives gracious or goodly or wonderful words. So that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. I mean, uh, it's interesting how we can see several of these uh, references in Song of Solomon chapter 2. Go to Song of Solomon 2, and we'll close it here. Song of Solomon 2. And then I want you to go to Habakkuk 3. Song of Solomon 2. And then Habakkuk chapter 3. Jesus Christ, for some of you who don't know, he is likened to a deer. He is likened to a deer. So this fits out very well. All right. Habakkuk 3, Song of Solomon chapter 2. Here we go. I'm going to read it. Song of Solomon 2 verse 7. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the what? Rose, and by the hinds of the field, that he stir not up, nor awake my love till he please. Solomon uh, pictures Jesus Christ in this text. Uh, a lot of uh, Christian commentators agree with that one. So notice that the picture of Jesus Christ is amongst the who? Amongst the rows, the hinds of the field. All right, uh, we look at Song of Solomon chapter 3, verse 5. Chapter 3 and verse 5. Notice that the picture of Jesus Christ is likened to a deer again. Chapter 3, verse 5. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, uh, that he stir not up, nor awake, and, uh, nor awake my love till he please. Again, Habakkuk chapter 3. And verse 19, Habakkuk 3, 19, the Bible reads here, The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds' feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringing instruments. So notice that God, uh, because he is likened to the deer, he can make other people follow him like the deer as well. So Jesus Christ is pictured as the deer. But it's strange how, um, uh, side note, okay, side note, it's strange how the devil would always like to picture Jesus Christ. So then uh, you get Harry Potter, who is tied, who have connections to deer, and Harry Potter, who died and resurrected, right? At the same time, has a lightning bolt symbol in his forehead, mark of the beast, you know? <laughs> yeah. Lightning bolt symbol in his forehead, where... Satan is described as lightning falling from heaven. So uh, anyway, the devil always wants to take uh, something from God for himself. Okay, so uh, hopefully you enjoyed uh, today's teaching and that you are able to learn a lot of stuff. Uh, let's see right here. Uh, so, in, so we're going to continue on uh, with the other tribes. Uh, Joseph and Benjamin are obviously going to be positive blessings right here. They're the, uh, oops, excuse me. They're the positive blessings right here. Oh, what just happened? Okay. And we'll cover uh, both of them uh, next week. Uh, uh, the next time I cover my Genesis study would be probably my last one. All right? So you don't want to miss the next Genesis study. We'll wrap things up, Lord willing, uh, the next time I do this. If not, then it'll be my second to last, but I'm pretty sure it'll be my last one. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. We grew so much in the scriptures, learned many things. Uh, I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, we'll be able to carry this with us and then be able to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.